Hello, hello everyone. So, uh, this is another re-recording. We're going to go through and look at all the double lift cards. I'm going to give my thoughts on those. So let's sort by focus, scroll down to double lift, and get right into this because there's a lot of these. Uh, the first double lift card we have is Ambient Burst. Ambient Burst is well below average. So the problem with ambient burst is usually by the time it's good the fight's over and it also anchors you so depending on how long the fight is and how big your ambient burst becomes it's going to anchor you for even longer which really sucks and on top of this it's one of these cards that only does five damage so you really need some spell power or on hit stuff to make this worthwhile because Bosses get one additional defense per tier, and on higher hell passes, most enemies also have defense, which makes these really high volume spells that do very little damage per hit much worse, because if you have nothing going with your ambient burst, it's going to do like one damage per hit. Overall, I think... Ambient Burst is a really mediocre card. I've tried to make it work multiple times, and every time it's just been disappointing. It takes too long to get online, and when it does come online, the anchor really sucks. And really, there's just much better stuff you can do to scale. So I would stay away from this one. Next up, we got Deck Slam. This card is pretty alright. Generally, you're looking to have at least 15 spells in the deck for this to become really good. And beyond that, it just becomes even better. I tend to think that bigger decks are much, much better than very small ones. So Deck Slam is a card I tend to take pretty frequently in the late game, especially when it comes with 2 times damage and consume. Because then it can just do a ton of damage. So I like it. The only issue is it's obviously quite terrible in the early game before you have a lot of cards in the deck already. So you'll, for the most part, know when to take this. It's a pretty self-explanatory card. Next up we got Echo. Echo is a broken card. It's uh, one of the most powerful cards in the game, in my opinion. So... The thing is that generally Echo is going to be a second copy of whatever the most powerful spell in your deck is. Or it's going to be another copy of whatever the best spell for the current situation is for 2 mana. This is so powerful. This also allows you to double dip into these huge consumption spells like Sunshine. Uh, keep in mind though that when you echo a consumption spell the echo will also consume but that's not a huge deal so echo generally i take it whenever i see it unless there's something really insane next to it because i mean it's just one of those cards that is always good no matter what and is always super super powerful and it's always going to synergize with whatever you're doing because you can just make it copy a really important synergy piece or if you don't need that you can just make it copy a, a really good agnostic card it can do literally anything the, the potential is sky high and the floor is pretty good too because just copying a decent spell like say you're just copying a firewall with this that's great too so echo is very very powerful there are very few times where i would not take it next up we got fling fling is kind of a weird one because i think the best circumstance where you would want fling is when you have a lot of these really expensive consumption cards like the aforementioned sunshine or Bulvitor or Midnight, then I think Fling becomes okay. Additionally, just having a lot of consumption cards in deck in general makes it 
pretty decent. The other use case is when you are trying to use it to thin your deck out, kind of like you would use True Grit in Slay the Spire, but it's not that great for that because I'd rather just fish for consumption upgrades or take cards that already consume if they're cards I'm going to want to consume eventually. So, Bling is a little bit underrated in my opinion. I don't think the card's great by any means, but I think it's better than people give it credit for, which isn't saying a whole lot because from what I've noticed, I have actually never seen anyone take Fling ever. Like, th this is a card I have never seen picked. I've picked it a couple times. I don't take it very often. I mostly just take it for experimentation. But it's been okay. It's not the best, but it's passable. You can use it to essentially cheese mana. Then it's pretty alright. But outside of that, uh, it's just a little bit mediocre, a little bit underwhelming. But if you have a lot of expensive consumption spells, it's a decent card. Next up we got Gambit. So this is one of a few methods for increasing your shuffle speed. Gambit is a card that becomes better the more mana regen you have. If you have a ton of mana regen and not a lot of places to spend that mana on, then Gambit becomes significantly better. On the other hand, if you have very poor mana regen, then Gambit's very bad. Also, it's worth noting that you should never take Gambit if you already have another way to increase your shuffle speed, and you should never take another way to increase your shuffle speed if you already have Gambit. Like, if you already have Gambit, then there is no point in taking Speed Loader, and vice versa. So, then there's the damage component, which is kind of secondary to the instant shuffle. The damage component, for every 16 cards in your deck, it's going to do approximately 30 damage on average to every enemy on the field. And that's not very impressive at all. At 32 cards, you're looking at 60 damage, so the damage component is pretty awful. Unless you're really, really, really interested in the shuffle time because, say, you're running the Viria spell package and Viria spell is free so you're not spending your mana anyway and your biggest limitation is shuffle time, then Gambit suddenly becomes really good because being able to spend the mana you were using anyway to shuffle your deck is really good in that circumstance and there are quite a few other strategies where Gambit works that way. So this is the kind of card you fit in specific strategies where you have a ton of excess mana. If that's not the case I would stay away from Gambit because it's just not terribly efficient. Next up we got Jam Cannon. So Jam Cannon is kind of at odds with Jam Slam because it wants you to cast it while the jams are still in your deck. So you want to cast all your jam stuff first and then before you get to your jams you cast a Jam Cannon. The way I usually run this is I'll take it in a jam package but I won't be happy with it unless I get double damage and consume on it. If I'm not running a jam package but I have mana jam then I'll take jam cannon and fish for double damage and consume on it because if I manage to do that the cannon is doing 160 times 3 damage which is 400 80 damage the first time through the deck and then after you've cast the jams from the mana jam it's out of deck so you don't have to worry about it anymore. That's a very very powerful thing to do but you need some specific pieces to make it work but when you do pull it off it's pretty spectacular especially since it's only it's zero mana which is great. Since it is a zero mana spell 
using or taking jam cannon if you already have some jam stuff going on is a pretty reasonable option though i would not recommend using it as your primary backloaded damage source and no matter what you're doing with it i highly highly recommend looking for consumption on it because it's just that kind of card it's the kind of card that becomes significantly worse the second time through the deck assuming you have some stuff that starts you off with jams but yeah i think it's a decent card the situations where you're gonna want it are pretty obvious when they show up next up we got jam slam this is kind of like the poster child for the jam package and it's okay the biggest issue with it is it's kind of hard to hit against enemies that are not rooted so this can do a ton of damage in the later stages of a fight however for it to really work you need a thinner deck so if you're running a jam package in a deck that has a lot of our stuff going on too it's not very good because you have to get through your deck a couple times for this to really become impressive which is probably the biggest reason that i think the jam package is one of the only ones that works better when it's your soul strategy so if i'm running this kind of package generally what i'll do is i will get everything that's not consumption or jam synergy out of the deck so that i can use the consumption stuff to front load damage in room fights and then all the stuff that consumes is out of the deck the first time through the deck on boss fights so that i just have my jam synergy package left and i can very quickly scale the jam slam up and that works quite well but it's more of a late game strategy because you need to get the pieces gear already then you need to get the appropriate upgrades and the appropriate removals but when you do manage to get that working it's pretty great uh, this is obviously a payoff card of course you're not going to take this by itself you need to already have the railgun already have the skewer etc etc if you don't have those this card is pretty terrible next up we got midnight this is another one i think people underrate but for a different reason than fling i think people avoid midnight because the proposition of midnight is kind of frightening really so you're consuming all the remaining spells in your deck and casting them do note that this is remaining spells. Any spells you've already cast before the Midnight will get shuffled back into your deck. They won't be consumed. So there are two ways to use this. One, well, actually there are three ways to use this. The first way is probably the most common way where you're just going to stick it in a very large deck try to cast some important synergy pieces early in the fight and then cast midnight when it shows up to get the rest of the deck out of there which is going to end most room battles on the spot if your deck is big enough it will also end a lot of boss fights very quickly so this front loads a ton of damage and then if it hasn't killed everything you just have the synergy pieces or just generally decent cards you cast at the start of the fight the next way to use this which is a bit more combo based is you use this in conjunction with a card like virgo spell and or uh eternity cannon which duplicates itself and then you pick midnight and try to get every card in the deck to consume when you do this what happens is when you cast a midnight your entire remainder of the deck will be consumed and since everything in the deck already consumes 
your entire deck will have been consumed. However, since Eternity Cannon and Virius Spell duplicate themselves, they will go back into the deck as a duplicate. And now your deck consists of just Virius Spell or just Eternity Cannon. This is kind of similar to the previous method I mentioned for using Midnight, except it has a much more clear, defined backload strategy, and it's just way more consistent. Problem is, you have to actually find Midnight and Eternity Cannon or Viri Spell, which can be a bit hard to pull off. The last way you're going to use this is just as a way to force front loaded damage which is kind of the same way as the first way but yeah overall i think people underrate this card because they're afraid of it they just don't want to deal with this they're afraid they're going to consume their whole deck but i don't think that's a good reason not to take midnight the card is unbelievably powerful when you get it to work right it does cost 6 mana, which is, I believe, the most expensive spell in the game mana-wise. I hadn't even thought of that. But yeah, I think people should definitely try this card more. It's very powerful. Although, you do need to kind of make sure that you're using it appropriately. Next up, we got Preload, which is another one that's increasing your shuffle speed. And this one's okay, it's kind of a card, it's a card you'd take all the same times you take Gambit, except it's a bit less, it's a bit less, what's the word, it's a bit less committal. Like you can just stick this in a random deck and it'll be okay, it won't be spectacular. It's much better in smaller decks because... The bigger your deck is, the longer your shuffle time is. So if you have a very small deck and your shuffle time is, let's say, 2 seconds, this is cutting your shuffle time in half. Unlike Gambit, if you find the the speed loader, preload's still very good because then they do stack. Unlike Gambit, which doesn't stack with any shuffle time decreasers. Reload does, however, not stack with anything that makes your shuffle instant. So if you're looking for this kind of shuffle time reduction effect, whichever one comes first is the one you're taking. So if Preload comes before Gambit, you're taking Preload. If Gambit comes before Preload, you're taking Gambit. And if you have something like a Dual Disc or a Flash Loader already, you're probably taking neither. Overall, I think this is a decent card. It's another one of those where you'll know when you want it. It scales very well with mana regen, namely. Lots of excess mana means preload becomes much, much better. Next up, we got Railgun. Railgun is kind of the gateway card to the jam deck because it's a card that is powerful enough to take by itself and you don't even need to have any jam synergies for it to be good. However, after you take Railgun, you have much more reasons to pick up jam synergies down the line. The reason Railgun is so good by itself, I'm not going to talk too much about how good it is when you have jam synergies that go with it, because that's pretty obvious. The reason it's so good by itself with no other jam stuff in the deck is because generally... Big decks are better than smaller decks, just generally. And what Railgun does is it's zero mana for 150 damage. That's a lot. However, the trade-off is that you're going to have to pay four mana down the line when you get to the end of your deck, which suddenly turns this into a terrible rate, assuming you have no jam synergies in the deck. So... What makes this really good is that on room fights, and if your deck is really large, even on boss fights, you won't get to that point. You'll get the 0 mana 150 damage spell, 
and you'll never get to the end of the deck where it can punish you. So this is just a spectacular way to front load damage. Uh, I take this card very often, especially on the higher hell passes, because room fights are a huge, huge danger. And being able to just get problem enemies out of the way ASAP is such a huge deal. And Railgun does that spectacularly. It's a very powerful card. Take it if you have a jam package. Take it if you don't have a jam package. Just take take this card. Next up we got Skier, which is kind of like Railgun's little brother. Skier's not as good as Railgun because it's just not doing as much damage. The idea is hopefully you're not getting to a point where jams are a problem. So give me as many jams as you like and more damage please and also in jam synergy decks it's not as good as railgun either because you're not adding as many jams to your deck so either way this is worse than railgun it's still a decent card you're still front loading a bit of damage but it's not a terribly impressive amount of damage so I take Skier sometimes. The problem with it, like with a lot of these zero cost spells, is that it's just not super impactful. And usually there is going to be a card next to it I'd rather have. That's not saying Skier is bad. This is still a good card. I just think it's not quite as good as Railgun. But if you are really, really desperate for front load damage, I would take it anyway. Because. Front load damage is so, so valuable in this game. And of course, if you're running the jam package, the card's good. Because it's 0 mana for 60 damage, and the jam is suddenly beneficial. Next up, we got Sustain. This is a Trinity card. So if Trinity's full, it gives you shield equal to damage of the spell in the other slot. And if Trinity is not full, it does nothing besides giving you Trinity. I don't like this card, it's just way too much work for such a strange effect. When I'm looking for shield, I, I want non-conditional shield, like I want shields up, I want Forte, I, I want Thermite and other artifacts that just give me shield unconditionally. Sustain doesn't do that. For Sustain to work, first off, I need to get Trinity going. And if I'm running a Trinity package, usually I want to be using that Trinity for damage instead. So running Sustain is already kind of questionable. Because I am not only wasting mana that I could have spent doing damage to gain shield, I'm also burning my Trinity to gain shield, which is further neutering my damage, which is ultimately going to make it more likely I get hit anyway. At, and what I'm trying to say is, if I'd spent that mana and Trinity just killing the enemy, there's a better chance I'm not getting hit in the first place, so I won't have needed the shield anyway. And then, once you have the Trinity going and you get the sustain, you have to wait to do a two-card combo with some high damage spell. In theory, you could combo this with like a Sarah Cannon or a Power Saws or something similar to get a huge amount of shield, but if you're already running the Sarah Cannon or the Power Saws and they're that powerful, this just seems like kind of a strange effect to put in the deck because you're already super powerful. And it also means that not only are you putting the sustain in your deck, you're also having to put other trendy stuff in a deck, which is going to make it take even longer to get back to the Sarah Cannon or back to the Power Saws. So there's just way too much work you have to do here to get the effect. It's just such a strange card. The, the ceiling's very high, but the floor is awful. I tend to stay away from this one because it's just it's impressive on paper but in practice this card just doesn't do anything 
Next up, we got Switchbait. Switchbait is, in my opinion, one of the most broken, most powerful cards in the game. It is, like, way up there. I would not be surprised if Switchbait got nerfed sometime in the near future, because this card is just absurd. Two mana. You're sh firing two shots that do damage equal to the damage of the spell in the other slot. So, switch bait if you have like a 150 damage spell. This is 300 damage for 2 mana. That's already the best rate for 2 mana in the game. The second best rate would be something like Monument or... Yeah, I think Monument is the second best rate for 2 mana in the game, but Monument's just so weird and hard and fanky to use. Switch Bay it is easy to use, you just have to have the cards and the spell slots. So, and that's just with a 150 damage spell. 200 damage isn't that uncommon. Cold Stone does 200 damage, and that's a common card. So, just going through the cards, like... Well, let's see. Let's see. Explosion, 500 damage. Uh, I think, I think since the change to Pyroblast, it actually counts as 150 damage. They actually buffed this card. It's super weird now. Uh, what else? What else? We we got Air Gun is okay. Mana Steel's okay. Power Saws is absurd. Sarah Cannon. Then there's other stuff down here, like you got your Ragnarok, your Monument. A lot of Kinesis stuff does really high damage. Fade Away, Bow Snipe. Uh, that's it, really. But the thing is, even just to be happy with Switchbait, you just need a 100 damage spell. Those aren't that hard to come by. And everything past that is just... Pushing the power level of the card to its limits. This is the kind of card that can just one-shot bosses, it can one-shot whatever, and even if it's not doing that, it's still good, because it's still doing really respectable damage. Generally, this is a card that I would take every time, unless I'm already... Well, unless either I don't want to take it because I'm tired of switch bait, or I'm already in a super dedicated strategy that does not involve switch bait. Other than those situations, I would take this card every time. It's absurd. The floor is pretty solid and the ceiling is unbelievable. Next up we got time slow. I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for saying this. But I don't think time slow is a super good card. Let me explain. So I, I know people are going to be angry in the comments saying, Oh, but time slows great. You can regen mana during the time slow and cast stuff. But hear me out. Time slow, uh, there's the gunner cheese with mana fire, obviously. It's very powerful, but it's super cheesy. I don't like doing it. I think it's kind of lame. On other loadouts, time slow essentially you're paying one mana for a defensive effect so it's kind of the same deal as playing up shields right so when when you take time slow you're essentially saying I don't have the confidence that I can not get hit and I need time slow in order to evade this stuff but this has the same problem as shields that being, you just spent one mana for a purely defensive effect when you could have spent that one mana on an offensive effect that would end the fight faster, meaning you would take less damage overall because the enemies are dead. So that's the big problem I have with time slow. I generally don't take this because... I would rather just do damage to the enemies to end the fight sooner than spend mana on a purely defensive effect. Next up we got Time Stop. Uh, time Stop is significantly worse than Time Slow because for one it costs twice as much and for two this stops your mana from regenerating. So 
you're essentially spending even more mana on a purely defensive effect. Uh, time Stop has all the same problems as Time Slow, except it's even worse because it costs more and stopping time is kind of questionable. Next up we got Trisect. This is kind of like your late game strategy if you're running a trendy package. So it does one third of the target's current HP when it's tricast and it's adding a jam and giving you trendy. 33 damage is kind of irrelevant. So if either A, well there are two situations where I think Trisect is really good. First one is obviously if you're running a trendy package and you can reliably get the trendy to get this thing to work that way. The other time is if I found the Trinet earlier in the run, then Trisect comes up, I'll for sure take Trisect because it just nukes bosses early in the fight. And if that's what's going on, generally I'll look for a consumption upgrade on Trisect as well. Because the second time through deck, it'll just be useless because I won't have any other ways to generate Trinity. And even if I did, the damage won't be as good as the first time. I think Trisect's a great card. You just need to have the proper setup to make it work. This isn't one I would take speculatively. I would only take this after I know for sure it's going to be good. Next up, we got Unleash. This is a card that I've really... Has really grown on me recently. So, Unleash, yeah, the damage rate's a bit inefficient. It's 70 damage per mana put into it for however much mana you spent, and it adds a jam. So, the thing with Unleash is the damage rate's passable, it's decent. But the big thing is you don't have to aim this, so you can just start the fight. Let's say you have blue blood and you start with unleash, you just press unleash and it, it clears the room sometimes if you have enough max mana. I think this is just a generally good card, it's a lot of damage and the fact that you can spend however much mana you want to spend on this gives it a bit of flexibility as well. The jam is kind of... Eh, it, it doesn't really change the card all that much. Like, it can be a little bit annoying if you're not in a jam package, and it's okay if you are, but I wouldn't think too much about the jam. But overall, I think this card's pretty decent. It's just flexible, you don't have to aim it, it's good in room fights, it's good on boss battles if you manage to root the boss, and it just kind of helps in the damage department quite a bit, because this guarantees that you're going to have a way to spend your mana on damage, and the damage rate you're getting is passable it's slightly inefficient like you can do better like this ain't thunder obviously but you know what this is the same rate as you're getting off of a non-flow cast trim no not tremor fracture so that's pretty decent one mana it, i generally expect to get 70 damage for one mana so this is on rate i like this card it's done good work for me it's reliable and it's flexible. Finally, we have Viria Spell. And once again, it's time to upset people in the comments. There are going be people in the comments telling me about how broken Viria Spell is and I'm not evaluating it right. And you can do this and that and this and that with it. But I, I don't think Viria Spell is very good. There, I said it. The problem with Viria Spell is there is a delay between when you cast a spell and when you draw the next spell. So you can't just instantly throw out all your various spells. 
So you have to spend one upgrade to remove the anchor on this, and then you need to spend two more upgrades to put whatever else you're going to put on this. But the problem I have with it is the area spell itself just doesn't do enough damage unless you can get so many upgrades on it that it's really pulling weight. Sure, you can get frost on it, but then you need to cast 12 Yuri spells on average to get the frost to go off. Sure, you can get flame on it, or bonus damage, or what, or whatever. But there's just so much more you can do with other cards than various spell. Other cards can just do so much more damage than this. But instead, people are sitting here doing the various spell thing and thinking it's the best thing ever when they could just be spending mana to cast spells that are much better than various spell and doing way, way more damage. Another problem is in room fights, various spells just bad because you're going to spend so much time shuffling if you're running only the various spell and if you're not just running the various spell then it's kind of doing nothing really and if you, you can't upgrade the various spell to remove the anchor then it's even worse uh, they did recently nerf this because apparently the dev thinks it's too powerful and they increased the anchor time so the card's even worse now problem is it just doesn't front load damage well enough and the back load damage isn't impressive enough to justify the lack of front loading that this brings to the table so that's all the double lift cards there are a few here that I'm sure are gonna be controversial and are gonna make people upset that I've said the things I've said about them but that's what I think of these cards. There are some really good cards here. I think on average, Double Lift has one of the higher concentrations of absolutely busted cards. But there are also a couple duds here, like Ambient Burst. But overall, I think Double Lift is a very powerful focus. Like on average, they just have a very high power level. So, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.